Welcome to the GMAT strategy. You're here because you believe there's a better way to study for the GMAT, and so do we. We created the GMAT strategy to maximize your results and minimize your efforts so you can get to the fun parts about business school and life as quickly as possible. My name is Isaac Puglia, and I've been teaching GMAT classes and tutoring privately for the GMAT for almost a decade, and I've helped thousands of students get into the business schools of their choice. I'm excited to be a part of your MBA journey because we all at TGS believe that the world can benefit from the best possible business leaders that we can find. If this show is bringing you value, please share it with your friends and family so that together we can make this process as easy and as painless as it could possibly be. Let's go. Today, I want to talk about how to be more disciplined. In the past week's episodes, I've been talking to you about the brand new GMAT focus exam, and I gave you a brand new reboot for 2024 on how you can start your studies in a very efficient way. And last week, I dove into how to structure your study time. So by now, you should have the what and the how. And the only thing that could really hold you back is not being able to execute on that information. So that's what today is going to be all about. Frankly, I get asked about discipline hundreds of times per year. It's one of the most requested topics to address. And the truth is, some of you are not struggling with discipline. You need the episode about how to relax and not be going 100 miles an hour all the time. But many of you, most of you are not in that boat and you're struggling to get into gear or you're struggling to stay in gear, even if sometimes you do get the motivation to get started. So I wanna bring you some very simple tactics today that I'm very hopeful are gonna make a huge difference in you developing a skill set that pretty much all of us recognize is critically important to having the things that we want. So why is discipline difficult? Well, I think a lot of us have a negative relationship to discipline, and that might be part of the reason you're struggling to be more disciplined is you have a lot of negative associations with it. For example, the dictionary definition or one dictionary definition is the ability to deliver on our best intentions and goals, even when we don't feel like doing it. We're able to put off short-term pleasures or endure short-term inconvenience or discomfort in pursuit of long-term gain. And that sounds great in theory, but really what you'll recognize is this is all about pain. <laughs> and for many of us, our association with discipline is not even this positive. It brings up images of some powerful being outside of us, forcing us to do things that we don't want to do, like a, like a slave driver or something negative like that. And so the first thing I want to do in our conversation is reframe discipline and redefine discipline the way that I personally like to think about it. The way I define discipline is remembering what I want. And that's how I recommend you define discipline for yourself as well. Discipline is just remembering what you want. Now, I didn't make this up. I've put together what I'm going to tell you today over many, many years of study into how I personally can become more disciplined because I, I think I'm naturally very undisciplined. And that caused a lot of problems for me, as you can imagine, as a young person and a young professional. And the ability to grow my discipline over time has been a major cornerstone of what I would call most of my successes at this point. And this thought, this simple reframe has been super powerful for me, and I am hope it's going to be very powerful for you because once you redefine discipline as just remembering what you want, then you can focus on the skill of remembering what you want better and more often. And if you can remember what you want, the why behind the difficult actions that you might be performing on a day-in, day-out basis, those actions get much easier to do. Because what I've personally discovered is that discipline is just a tension between my current desire to avoid the thing that I should be doing and my long-term desire to have the outcome of the thing that I should be doing. And that tension is where I need to deploy more or less willpower. And so we're going to attack this problem from both angles. I'm, in a moment, I'm going to show you how to decrease the difficulty of the thing you're doing. But I want to lead off by increasing your focus on the long-term outcome because that's one of the biggest and fastest levers that you can pull to become more disciplined today. So the first tool I'm going to introduce you to, you might be familiar with, it's something very simple called a vision board. And it's just a collection of things that you want to be, do, and have. Now, the vision board concept, I think, has been really dragged through the mud with this whole concept of magically manifesting things. And I, I'm not here to judge 
whether that magical type of manifestation either works or doesn't work, whether you should do it or not do it. It's really not my concern. I focus on the things that I practically believe will help me. And you're welcome to believe whatever you want. I'm talking about manifesting. I'm not even talking about manifesting, but if I were to talk about it, I would be talking about it in the most literal sense, which is I performed an action and that action produced a desirable result. That that's that's the thing that we're focusing on here today. And the vision board is just there to remind you of what you want. What is the long-term outcome of the actions that you're taking today? And the truth is, if you look at this vision board on a regular basis, you will have an easier time staying motivated. You'll have an easier time staying inspired and you'll have an easier time doing difficult things that would otherwise require a lot more discipline than they would require if you just connected to the end result of your actions on a more consistent basis. So just collect it. That's my advice. I'll give you some instructions on this in a sec. My advice is don't judge it. Don't worry if it's realistic. You'll probably end up changing it in a few months or a few years anyway. So it's really just a catalog of what's inspiring to you right now. And the, the, again, the purpose is to take the focus off of the cost of the actions that you're performing today and put more of the focus on the payout of the actions you're taking today. So <clears throat> what I recommend is look at it on a daily basis and add to it on a weekly basis. And what I like to do is set a little bit of time aside on my weekends or whenever you take days off and just spend maybe five to 10 minutes. It's not a significant time investment, just surfing the internet, looking for things that sound exciting. It could be cool experiences, it could be places I wanna travel, it could be possessions I wanna own or the types of people I wanna spend time with, the types of relationships that I wanna develop. And you're just looking for pictures that remind you of the feeling that you get when you think about having the things that you want. And don't worry if you're not super clear on what you want long-term in your life. Focus on the things you are clear that you want and fill your vision board with those things that you are actually clear on. You may not know where you want to live in five years or 10 years. You may not even care. Maybe you're more the spontaneous type of person. Okay, cool. Well, then what do you want? You probably want something either right now or in the near future. So focus on that and add that to your vision board. I just have a simple album on my phone and I just add to that album and uh, take things out as they're not inspiring to me anymore. And, and that's what I recommend you do. It's a very, very easy way to do it. But there are more involved ways you can make a vision board, like you can make them physically and, and use clip outs from magazines or print things out from the internet and put it on your refrigerator or put it on a, in a place that you're more likely to see it more often. I mean, in my experience, that's all icing on the cake and it's honestly not required to make this work for you. But if you're gonna be struggling to look at it on a regular basis, then put it somewhere more prominent like that. And that'll probably really help you out. So how does this help us? Well, if you have a difficult task to do and you're the type of person who struggles to follow through on it, meaning you're lacking discipline right now, then you're probably focusing more on the pain of doing it and you're not very focused on the outcome, the result that doing it is actually going to get you. And so our goal is to start thinking less about that painful part of it and more about what does this difficult task produce? You want to think about it like an investor. If you're an investor and all you focus on is the cost of investments, then you're always going to buy the cheapest investment, irrespective of the return on capital. And as many of you who work in investing know, a lot of times the cheapest investments are the worst investments, not always, obviously, but many times they are. And it's the, the willingness and ability to pay a higher price for an asset that actually produces these really fantastic returns over time. So this is a way that we're doing that emotionally for ourselves. We're decreasing the emotional cost and we're increasing the emotional reward, which makes it an easier investment to make. Now, I've gotten to the place at certain times in my career where I was working on really difficult projects that I was really struggling to get momentum on. And I would look at my vision board when I sat down to do the project. Sometimes I had to remind myself that specifically, and it helped. It didn't completely make the pain disappear. And I'm not here talking to you about how to make your life completely pain-free. That's not the purpose of this episode. I'm here to talk to you about how you can have more discipline, have more of the things that you want and make it easier to do 
not necessarily delete any negative feelings from your life whatsoever. We could make the argument that that wouldn't even necessarily be a good thing, but we're not here to have philosophical debates. We're here to keep things focused on practical actions you can take. So on a regular basis, if you're connecting to the why behind the challenging tasks that you have set out for yourself, it'll decrease the cost benefit ratio in favor of the benefits. So you're just remembering what you want more. And if we define discipline as just remembering what you want, then that will automatically make you more disciplined. So what we're focusing on there, again, is just building up the payout, not even decreasing the cost, but just building up the size of the payout relative to the cost, which shrinks the perception of the cost, which makes it more easier to take action. Now, the other side of this is shrinking the challenge of difficult tasks. And that's what I want to pivot to and focus on now. If you have questions about the vision board or what I'm recommending there, reach out anytime. So we reframe discipline. Now let's reframe resistance. Resistance is a catch-all term that I'm going to use to describe the emotional wall that many of us come up against when we think about doing difficult or unpleasant tasks or tasks maybe that we're just not very good at yet. And so they're not very pleasurable to do. We feel the challenge and we feel like it hurts our ego. It doesn't make us feel good about ourselves. So when you feel that initial wave of, I don't feel like doing this right now, or that sounds uncomfortable, or you start to feel the impulse of, oh, I'll just do it tomorrow. That's all resistance. That's, that's what I, I'm using this term to define this sort of like imp impersonal internal force that keeps us from taking action on things that are like rational to take action on, like working out on a regular basis or sticking to a diet. Those are very rational things to do, but they don't always feel emotionally good. And that's where resistance can come into play and really sabotage our results. So we want to start to reframe resistance, not as a bad thing, but as a good thing. Because if you think about the concept of resistance in general, that's actually a really important tool for how we improve ourselves. Resistance is how we get stronger. It's very difficult to get stronger without resistance. So many of you are into lifting weights. That's called resistance training. What are you doing? Well, you're Im improving, increasing the capacity that your body has to deal with resistance. And you increase the resistance over time and your body adapts in step. If you're more into running, for example, instead of lifting weights, then your body might resist running the fourth mile if you've been consistently running three miles a day for a long time. You might have an emotional resistance to that. You might feel physical resistance to that, like your body starts to get fatigued or you start to have difficulty maintaining your good running form. All of those are forms of resistance. And without those forms of resistance, it would be almost impossible to actually get stronger. <laughs> So when you realize that resistance can be an ally, if you learn how to use it, that's when you can start to reframe resistance as a positive thing, which again, decreases the emotional pain we feel when dealing with resistance. And here's a good analogy to help you understand this. If you're not feeling resistance in a workout, the workout is probably too easy and you're probably not growing. And many of us have a pretty positive relationship to this when it comes to physical exercise. Does it feel good to push through that last rep or that last set in a difficult workout? Many of you might be addicted to that feeling. My guess is you have gone through workouts in your life that were too easy. How did those feel? Probably like you were wasting your time. And that's how your studying is going to feel. That's how a lot of areas of your life are going to feel if you don't develop a better relationship to resistance when it comes up in those areas. Because think about it this way. Think about if you were trying to get in better shape, but every time you came up against that point of resistance where you were finally going to transcend your current physical capacity and push through to the other side, what if you just stopped as soon as you felt that resistance and all your workouts could never go past that level of difficulty? What would happen to your fitness goals? You probably couldn't reach them. If your goal is to build more muscle, you would be physically incapable of building that muscle because you just would stop right when you were about to get the benefit of the workout. You know, think about how absurd that is for a second, right? Or for, for you who are more uh, runners or cardio focused or focused on other, other forms of exercise. It's just the resistance training thing is just a really convenient analogy, but like 
Think about if you were trying to train for a marathon, but every time you got to the third mile, you just stopped and you just never pushed past that third mile. Well, it's going to be very, very difficult on marathon day to get to mile 27. <laughs> That's going to be really tough. You never went past mile three. So it's your ability to confront and recognize resistance and reframe that resistance as a positive thing that makes you good at physical training. So I want you to think about that because most of us have a very positive relationship to confronting resistance in our physical workout routines, but we have a very negative relationship to confronting resistance when it comes to growing mentally and when it comes to growing emotionally. A lot of us have been conditioned to just stop as soon as things are frustrating or stop as soon as things get hard intellectually or stop when things get hard emotionally. Now, I do want to make a caveat here. None of this is medical or psychiatric advice. And if you're struggling emotionally, then please get professional help. I'm not qualified to give you that help. I'm just talking about confronting emotional resistance from the perspective of improving your physical performance and your ability to positively transcend negative emotions. Okay. I'm not talking about doing anything emotionally unhealthy. If, if that's what you think I'm recommending, then you are wrong. And that is not at all what I'm recommending. And if you're doing something unhealthy, stop doing that immediately and get professional help and do the healthy thing. I'm talking about the healthy level of, I feel emotionally bad when I think about sticking to my workout routine today and I don't listen to that negative emotion and I go do the workout and I feel great about it and it's 100% the healthy thing to do. That's what I am talking to you about right now, okay? That type of emotional resistance. M many of us have a very negative association with that, even though our association with physical resistance is quite positive. And so what I want you to do or what I want to help you do today is start to borrow from that positive relationship that you have to resistance in physical training and start to recondition yourself with mental training to feel that resistance and enjoy it. In fact, maybe even seek it out as a sign that you are pushing on the edge of your comfort zone and you're growing. Because what we're doing when we're studying for a difficult exam like the GMAT is we are growing intellectually. You're becoming a better decision maker. You're becoming better at managing time. You're becoming better at managing your emotions. All things that virtually 100% of successful leaders will tell you are extremely important skills for getting where you want to go with your career. So it's good to recognize that the GMAT is a very helpful adversary, a very helpful mental gym, if you will, that can help you start to become the person who you want to be right now. You don't even necessarily need to go to the MBA program to start that process. Obviously, the MBA is a super important step in this. But the GMAT doesn't just have to be a negative chore. It can be something that is a form of resistance that's helping you improve yourself. And I think adopting that frame, while it might take some mental energy to reframe that for yourself, it's going to make engaging with the process a lot easier emotionally. It's going to decrease the challenge of maintaining your commitments to yourself, which really is what discipline is all about, keeping the commitments we make to ourselves and to other people. So again, I just want to be clear. I'm not talking about doing something super unhealthy. I'm just talking about learning to transcend the emotional barriers and the psychological barriers that are probably holding you back right now. I'm not talking about suppressing everything uncomfortable in your life just to avoid discomfort altogether. I, I do think that probably is super unhealthy and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about confronting it in a healthy way, recognizing, okay, I could frame this as a problem that I'm feeling bad about working out right now, or I could frame this as an opportunity. This, this is some weight on an emotional or psychological bar that I can lift up transcend and improve so that next time I confront this emotional resistance, it's even easier for me to deal with it. Just like it would be easier for me to lift a heavy weight if I've already trained to lift that heavy weight in the gym. So what's important here is that you're putting yourself into a place of control. You control the relationship. And what's happening for a lot of you who struggle with discipline is you're out of control with that relationship. As soon as the emotional pain wave hit or, or, or any form of resistance, internal, psychological, or emotional resistance hits, you just cave. Um, or you start to rationalize like, oh, it's not that important to do it. You know, rationalization is really just a, a form of an excuse as to 
why it's really just a way to make yourself feel better that you're that you're lying to yourself and not keeping your commitment with yourself. Now, are all rationalizations that? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you want to be careful with rationalizations. They're very it's a very slippery slope, okay? So eventually you can get to a point where resistance becomes a signal that you're on the right path. And when you think about studying and you think, I don't feel like doing that right now, that's actually a trigger for you to sit down and get started and do it. Because I want to share something really interesting with you about procrastination that I, I think is going to help you with this. But more than anything, you want the ability to do the thing. You want to become the type of person who, whether you feel good about it or not, you're capable of sitting down and taking the actions that you need to get the results you want. And I'm here to help you build that skill set. This is part of that skill set in my experience. Okay, again, be healthy, seek the healthy edge with this, just like working out, get professional advice if you need it. Just like lifting too much weight in the gym is going to hurt you, not make you stronger. There's a limit to this type of mental and emotional conditioning as well. And I am only recommending that you find the healthy edge. None of this is medical or psychiatric advice. I'm not qualified to give that advice. I'm only qualified to give you advice about how to get incredible results on the GMAT. So procrastination is a, a very common type of resistance. And what happens when you think about doing an unpleasant task, this is something that's been actually really well documented and studied especially recently. When you think about the unpleasant task, it actually lights up the same pain receptors in your brain as physical pain. And this is the root of procrastination. It's kind of crazy. So if I, let's say I'm really tired at the end of a work day, but I have a study session planned for GMAT and I'm really not feeling good about studying it. I really don't feel like sitting down to study. I just feel like chilling out, eating some food and watching some TV. Let's say that's the case. So when I think about studying, the pain receptors in my brain will light up and they are the same pain receptors as if I touched a hot stove, stubbed my toe, got hit by a car in a crosswalk. Obviously, that's a super extreme example, but it's that same experience for the brain internally. And the brain doesn't want to feel that pain. And so what it does is it immediately shifts its attention to something more pleasurable and then rationalizes the decision to do the pleasurable task and avoid the painful task. And that is the root of procrastination. That's like the physical way that procrastination manifests in the body. Isn't that interesting? I find that fascinating personally. But what's also super interesting in these studies when they hook people up to RMIs and, uh, sorry, uh, MRIs, CAT scans, et cetera, EEGs, is that... Once you sit down to perform the unpleasant task, the pain receptors in the brain shut off and it's no longer painful. It's only about confronting the thought of doing it. The thought of doing it is the painful moment. The actual doing of the task is where the pain goes away. And a lot of times people report getting into the zone like a flow state after transcending that initial wave of resistance, which is why I'm so passionate about you developing a toolkit to handle resistance better and reframing resistance as a positive. So I'll give you a personal example. When I sit down to do a difficult task or difficult work, I frequently feel phys that physical sensation of pain and resistance in my body. Like it is harder to move quickly toward the desk. That's how intensely I feel this. Uh, my brain will often shift its attention to something else. Like I'll find myself unconsciously picking up my phone to click on social media very devious thing to do to myself. It's totally unconscious, by the way. I'm not even aware that I'm doing it until I realize why am I looking at this social media platform right now? I'm supposed to be doing X, Y, or Z. And so I really struggled with resistance. I, it's still a struggle on a day in, day out basis today. But what I've done is I've realized that when that stuff starts happening to me, that's when I am on track and I'm doing the right things with my time and my life to get the ultimate outcome that's on my vision board. I've just completely reframed that experience to be a positive indicator, a green light that yes, I have the go ahead. Yes, I'm doing the right things with my time and my life right now. Instead of what it used to be, which is, shouldn't I be doing something that I'm happy about right now? Shouldn't I be having fun right now? Shouldn't I be out in the sun? Hey, listen, I'm a huge proponent of going out in the sun and having fun at the time of your choosing. 
<laughs> when you actually, when that is actually what you want to do, and that is actually the right thing for you to be doing, you should be doing that. But when it is actually the time to be studying or sitting down and taking care of business, and all you're doing is going out in the sun, I can tell you from experience, that is a very, very dark path that nobody wants to go down. Because then what you're admitting is you don't have the ability to create the life you want. And I lived that life and it sucks. I will just tell you that it sucks. The constant pleasure seeking is a total waste. You want the right balance for you. Everybody's balance point is going to be different. My balance point is pretty hardcore. I actually really like to work now and I've really embraced this. And I still get out and have a ton of fun. I'm one of the happiest people that I know. Other friends that I have and other associates I have, their balance point's way different. We still get along great. There's no right or wrong. I'm not telling you how to live your life. I'm trying to give you the tools to make informed choices that are aligned with your personal desires. That really is my role in your life here. I'm trying to help you get a great result on this thing so that you can have the things that you want from an MBA. So just a quick case study with procrastination there and a little bit of personal advice in case it's helpful. This podcast is not about me. It's about you. But I want to let you know you're not alone in the struggle. And just like when you started going to the gym and working out, if you're familiar with that experience, you might not have been super strong from day one. And you might not be so strong with this stuff from day one, but you can get better. And I was the least disciplined person there for a minute in my life. And I wish I could get that time back, but... Hopefully I work hard enough now to make up for it. Um, and if any of you have a time machine, I'm, I'm, I will be an early adopter. <laughs> but until we get something like that going, this is the next best thing. Best thing is, uh, is start becoming more disciplined today. <laughs> What's that saying? The best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. And the second best time is today. So let's, let's be those people. So what's the tool for overcoming procrastination and helping you become better at transcending resistance? Well, I talked about the mental reframe, but that's not going to be enough for some of you. And that's totally fine. It's just a tool. And you can take from today what's going to be most helpful for you and discard anything else. So one of the most valuable tools that has been research backed to help with procrastination is called a Pomodoro. And many of you are going to be very familiar with the Pomodoro technique. Many of you probably use it on a day in day out basis. I'm a huge user and proponent of the Pomodoro. And I use it every day, many, many, many times a day in, in my work blocks. And I'll have probably eight to 16 work blocks, depending on how busy the day is for me. And instead of just going 100% end to end, I'll usually set up a period of time that I know I can focus. And then I'll give myself a little bit of downtime before the next work block begins. And that's the basic structure of the Pomodoro. The basic structure of the Pomodoro is 20 minutes of focused effort where you put everything on do not disturb, silent, can't be bothered, block out all the potential distractions, focus on your task, and then you give yourself five to 10 minutes of a reward. And it could be anything that you want to reward, time on social media, texting your buddies, reading a fun book, engaging with a creative project you like, having a quick snack, could be all the above at different points in your day. What I've found works best for me personally when it comes to work blocks is at least 45 minutes of focused effort and then five to 15 minutes of a little bit of a breather. And a lot of it's going to depend on the day I'm having, how much sleep I got, whether I'm dieting or not. There's all kinds of factors that affect our energy and, and willpower. But the key is to figure out something that works for you. And it's such a simple tool. It's so easy to implement. And there's tons of apps out there if you want some support with this. Uh, what's an app I got introduced recently that's really good? Toggle Track, T-O-G-G-L. T-O-G-G-L, Toggle Track. It's free. There's also, I think, a paid tier for it, but it has Pomodoro's built in. It has time tracking built in. It's a really cool tool. And let me know if you decide to give it a go. I hope it helps you out. So now you've got the vision board and you've got the Pomodoro technique, two painfully simple tools that you can use to become more disciplined right away. If you engage with these, I promise they will help. I can't promise that I can make studying for the GMAT completely pain-free. That would be amazing. And if we can develop that technology or that pill where you take the pill and you're instantly great at the GMAT, I will let all of you know first, okay? But this is, this is the next best, best thing that I have for you, okay? Now, final thing that we can use to make unpleasant tasks easier to engage with. We talked about increasing the payout focus. 
via the vision board. Okay, that makes hard things easier. We talked about reframing resistance. That makes hard things easier because the hard thing, instead of being bad, becomes good. And then we talked about Pomodoros, which is really just a specific way of doing what I'm about to talk to you about right now, which is shrinking your task size. A lot of times we are too caught up in doing the ideal version of a difficult task. Like I'm going to study six hours a day. I'm going to beat all my coworkers, GMAT scores by the end of this month. And that's a very, very understandable desire, but it's not always realistic. And that can sometimes set us up for failure and lead us to get into this negative cycle of becoming less disciplined, not more disciplined, which is the opposite of what we want. So here's something you can experiment with if what I'm talking about right now resonates for you. If you're the, I got to study six hours a day and anything less than that is a failure. And when you think about sitting down and studying for six hours a day and you only get two hours a day, you're like, I'm never going to be good enough to study six hours. And then you just start studying zero hours a day. That's not helpful. And what I want you to consider is taking the ideal situation and shrinking it down a little bit. Let me be more specific, okay? Imagine a, a, a continuum in your mind right now. And on the left side, we have easy. And on the right side, we have hard or, or ideal. And I want you to imagine the ideal physical fitness routine for you. Like the thing that's going to get you in the killer shape that you've always wanted or even better shape than you're in right now. The thing that's a little bit unrealistic for you, though, given your other commitments and I want you to think about that as the ideal. So let's maybe define that as like two hours a day at the gym with a top personal trainer going like a 9.8 or 10 out of 10 intensity with perfect nutrition all around and doing that 100% of the time. Every single day you have like the perfect workout, okay? That's the ideal and that's fantastic. I am a huge proponent of striving for that kind of thing. But what I want you to do is I want you to shrink that to, okay, that's the ideal, but what's realistic? What's realistic for me personally in terms of a workout? Think about your personal commitments. Think about your work commitments. Think about how you feel at the end of the day or beginning of the day when you're going to be able to fit this workout in around your other important commitments. And maybe the realistic workout is like 45 minutes. Maybe that's really the best that you're going to get out of yourself on a lot of days. Maybe there's weekend days where you can do 90, but most of the time it's, it's going to be 45. Okay. And this is just an example and maybe realistically, you're only going to get a 7 out of 10 intensity out of yourself on workouts because you're just exhausted because you have, maybe have a super demanding job. Or maybe you're living with family and you're taking care of your family on the side and supporting them financially or, or physically or personally. It could be all kinds of things you're dealing with. And maybe the best you're going to get is moderate nutrition. Maybe, maybe you're financially constrained in terms of your nutrition. Maybe you are time constrained in terms of your nutrition and you, you have to eat the meals provided at work even though they're just okay for you. Because you got to save money or you got to save time or you, you just haven't gone to the grocery store in six months because you need to make sure that you're taking care of your brother who's sick. I don't know. I don't know what kind of situations you're all dealing with. But these are just examples of what would prevent us from doing the ideal workout and force us into the realistic workout. Okay, so once you've established what's realistic for you in terms of the workout, then I want you to shrink it down to easy. So what is the thing that you could totally do, no questions asked, where you would almost laugh at it and be like, 45 minutes is realistic. I could do 30 minutes a day, no problem. Like, psh, I probably waste 30 minutes a day on my phone right now. Are you kidding? I could get 30 minutes a day in the gym. That's that's nothing. And uh, I could do a 6 out of 10 intensity without even breaking a sweat. Like, it'd be no big deal. I'm just kind of going through the motions anyway. And I could definitely eat some bad stuff. <laughs> like, I could definitely have some... Uh, some unhealthy fast food that just sounds really good and is cheap. And, um, you know, that would be the easy version of the workout. So I want you to imagine this if you're, if you're the type of person who struggles with a workout or just as an example of shrinking the task size. So what you're going to do if it's a task you struggle with is you're going to map out the ideal, you're going to map out what's realistic, and then you're going to map out what's easy. And you're going to do the easy version of it three days in a row to just get some momentum. And what that does is it completely deletes the emotional pain wave that you might be feeling because some of you might try to reframe it and it's just not going to work for you. And I respect that. That's, that's totally fine. Honestly, that was me when I first started engaging with all this stuff. I was a little baby. Call it what it is. Not trying to insult you. I'm sorry if I did, but I'm just telling you what I was. 
which was a little baby about it. And fortunately, I matured. <laughs> but back to the point. Let's say we transition to the study world. My guess, if you're still listening to this, is you might struggle to stay disciplined with your studies. And part of that might be you are trying to engage with the ideal study plan instead of engaging with the realistic study plan. Some of you might be engaging with the realistic study plan and realize it's still a struggle for you. So if that's you, what I want you to do is I want you to map out what is the easy study plan. What's the amount of studying that you can easily, no questions asked without breaking a sweat, engage with for three days in a row? Maybe it's three minutes of studying. Maybe it is really that bad for you right now. What I want you to do is I want you to commit to studying three minutes a day for three days in a row. After you have done the easy way three days in a row, you expand it by 20%. So let's take something a little bit more realistic. Let's say 10 minutes a day is the easy threshold for you, where it's like 10 minutes a day, Isaac, that's that's never going to get me my goal, but I could easily do that. I agree. 10 minutes a day GMAT prep is probably not going to take you from a 450 to a 700 in three months. Like that's just unbelievably unlikely. Could you get there in seven years? Probably. But my guess is you want it to go faster than that. Okay. So the way to do that is more time spent on the right things. It's the whole purpose of this information and why I put it out. So let's shrink it down to easy. 10 minutes a day, focused on the easiest strength area that that you could possibly work on, okay? So you're just going to do that for three days, and then you're going to expand it 20%. So instead of 10 minutes, you do 12. And you do that for three days in a row, and then you expand it again 20%. So you go from 12 to, it's going to be harder to do in my head now, but uh, that's, let's see, 2.4. So that's 14.4 minutes. You don't have to be that exact with it. But that's the idea, is we want to go from 12 to, let's call it 15 minutes and then from 15 to 18, and then from 18 to 21. And you don't want to rush this process. You just keep expanding at 20% until you get to realistic. Now, once you hit your realistic benchmark three days in a row, then you can expand that 20% if you want to, and you can start to stretch to ideal. But too many of you are trying to go from zero to ideal in one day and trying to do everything perfect 100% of the time, and you're setting yourself up for failure. It's too hard. It's too painful. It's not realistic. And you're just inviting the self-judgment to grow. We all have that voice in our head that's just like, I told you you couldn't do this. I told you it was going to be too hard for you. I don't know. Maybe all of us don't have that, but a lot of us have it. And if that's you, you don't want to give that voice in your head more fuel. You don't want to give it more fuel. You want to starve it by just executing on the easy thing three times in a row and then expanding executing on that three times in a row and expanding. It's just like a physical fitness routine, everybody, where you're going to start with what's easy. You're going to avoid injury at all costs, and you're going to keep scaling up your resistance over time until even a high level of resistance is doable for you. You might still not want to work out, but you'll have the muscles to actually do the workout, which is what becoming disciplined is all about. All right. So You might backslide many times. That's my caveat for this. Even if you're engaging with this stuff perfectly, adult life is intense sometimes. You might have personal issues come up. You might have health issues come up. And you might get a really good streak going for six weeks and then totally fall off. And the most important skill that you can develop in becoming more disciplined is the skill of recommitting. Because I don't know anyone who's perfect and who executes at 100%, 100% of the time. I know some people who are darn close, though. And what they're great at is recognizing when they're drifting from the plan and recommitting to the plan right away. And that's that's what I'm going to invite you to become great at. Just start becoming a great recommitter. Maybe it's been six weeks since you studied and you're feeling really guilty about that. Well, there's never a better time to study than right now. There's never a better time to study than tonight. Just start that momentum back on the right path and shrink the task size. What's the easy amount of study that you could do tonight? Because you've probably been resisting it for so long because you're thinking, well, if I can't do the ideal amount of study tonight, then I suck and I'm never getting into Harvard anyway. And there's all kinds of negative conditioning that happens inside of humans' minds. And that's just part of the game. It's it's probably not going anywhere. You just want to get better at dealing with it. That's what I've tried to help you do here today. So... Quick recap, your vision board helps you expand the positive aspects of doing difficult activities, makes them easier as a result. 
self-discipline is just remembering what we want. If we become better at remembering what we want, it becomes easier to do the things we want to do. That might be hard in the moment. Number two, we want to reframe resistance. If we're feeling an emotional resistance to something or an emotional pain wave that's like, don't do it. Take it easy, man. You've had such a tough day already. Don't push yourself, you know? <laughs> start to become the type of person who can transcend that. Now, if you're experiencing physical pain, that's when you stop. But transcending emotional pain, you want to get really, really, really good at that. Third thing I talked to you about is the Pomodoro technique. 20 minutes or whatever works for you of focus time where you delete all your distractions, you focus on the task, you do the task, and then you hit a quick reward. That'll help you start to physically recondition yourself to crave the focus time. And then shrink the task size. If you're resisting something to the degree that you are unable to make yourself do it, then you got to do the easy version first. You got to humble yourself. Be okay doing the easy version, the small version, going into the gym and lifting the five pound weights. And eventually after three days in a row, you can move to the six pound weights. And then after three days of that, you can move to the tens. Okay. But I don't want you going zero to 450 pounds because that's probably going to really jack you up. And that's the opposite of what we want to do here. We want to build ourselves. That requires the right balance of compassion and being a little hard on ourselves sometimes and talking to ourselves in a way that is respectful. Because when you're telling yourself that you're capable of doing the things that you want to do, that is you respecting your abilities. And when you tell yourself you're not capable of doing it, that's disrespecting yourself. And that's going to make everything a lot harder. Just focus on the thing you can do. Get some momentum in the positive direction and then expand that 20% after three days in a row. And if you fall off, start it easy again, build your way right back up. It's that simple. Okay, this is a deep topic. There's a lot more that I could share with you. I've been on this path for many, 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 many decades, and I'm probably not getting off it anytime soon, everybody. I'm trying to build my discipline every single day. And if you have some tools for me, I'm wide open, man. If you want more advanced tactics, let me know. I wanted to keep this as simple as possible while still making it super relatable and basically universally applicable for all of you. If you're not sure how to develop your personal discipline and you're struggling with something that's unique to you, reach out to us and we will do our absolute best to help you over DM. We're at the GMAT strategy on most current social channels. As always, my greatest hope is that this material will make your studies as easy and as painless as they can possibly be. If you want more tips and strategies for optimizing your performance on the GMAT, as always, head to our website, thegmatstrategy.com, and check out our free video presentation on how to reach your dream GMAT score in half the normal time. In the meantime, this is a weekly show, so please subscribe, and as always, stay positive and stay consistent with your studies. I'll talk to you soon.